name is Karen Gong. I'm a volunteer and a trustee from CCHA or Click Credit Historical Association. And I have the honor of introducing a fellow trustee and a good friend. Um, Dick is like an expert on Lozier. It's really exciting to listen to him. I'm not sure how he's going to get it all into the timeline he's got, but I'm sure you really enjoy it. So, Dick, I'll leave it up to you. And I promise not to put you to sleep, hopefully. <laughs> I'm going to get this out. We had 140 slides to begin with. I cut it back to 100. But I hope you find this interesting. Uh, I, I was told I have to use a microphone. And, let, me, uh, uh, let me get that. Okay. I have so I'm going to keep it Apparently we have a, a computer, the screen up here translates uh, uh, into uh, what I'm saying into words, somehow or other, <laughs> while I'm talking. That's something new for me. <laughs> what do we do? Testing, one, two, can you hear me now? Yeah. Can everybody hear me okay, including back there? Okay, thank you. How are we set? Just waiting for it to start off. <laughs> Modern technology. Yeah, well, we're going to, I will start here. And the first of all, um, I was born in Plattsburgh, 1944. I graduated from Plattsburgh High School. My mother graduated from Plattsburgh High School. My father graduated from MAI. So my whole family's here, was from here. Uh, my mother was a manager that worked, uh, was a, she worked for Key Bank. My father was a city fireman for the Plattsburgh Fire Department. And the little story I want to tell you ahead of time is that I was uh, on vacation in 19, uh, six, uh, 1977. I uh, was on a, a quest. I bought a new motor home, small one, and I was going out to the Bilhara Car Museum in Reno, Nevada. I was in search of three cars. Uh, the first, well, the two, first two cars are what they call the Bugatti Royale. You probably haven't ever heard of it, but if you did, uh, it was at one time the most expensive car in the world. None have, there's only six. None of them have been sold in probably 40 years. And the last time one was sold, it was for multi, multi millions of dollars. So I wanted to see these cars. And the other car was called the Thomas Flyer. And we're going to talk about that in a few minutes here once we get started with the program. So anyway, I'm going down through, can everybody hear okay? What do you say about it? If you can't hear me, you can look on the screen, okay? <laughs> Wow, that's something. <laughs> okay, anyway, so I'm going through these cars at the Harlem Museum, and all of a sudden I came into this white car. Most of the cars were black, and very kind of boring looking old clunkers of cars, one after the other. And all of a sudden I saw this white car, and it's like, what the heck is this thing? I took a picture of it, and in those days I had a, a camera that had just filmed. I wouldn't know whether it came out until I got back from vacation. And uh, then I went around the front and I looked at the plaque and it said a Lozier built in Plattsburgh, New York. It was a 1906 Lozier. Uh, the car uh, originally, I believe, was $5,500 in 1906. And uh, so I thought, wow, this is, I never heard of this. I'm a car enthusiast, uh, but I never heard of this. So I put it in the back of my mind. And then, I guess, fast forward about 25 years or so, uh, I was, uh, manager of the Ritz camera store up here in the mall and this gentleman Anthony Vaccaro came in and uh, he said he wanted an enlargement of a car and uh, so I was helping in the enlargement and said by the way what kind of car is this he said it's a Lozier and bing there it is there's the answer here's a Lozier so uh, he told me that when I uh, was done retired when I was done working uh, I should come over to the museum and check it out and I did and I stayed for 15 years so um, I'm going to try to share with you the uh, little bit of the story of the Lozier family. Uh, I get my clicker working here. So uh, I think it's working. Oh, I'm turning it on. Hang on a second. Where am I pointing here? No, Julie's our technical assistant here. <laughs> Okay, so this is Henry Abram Lozier. He was born in Indiana in 1843. He died May the 25th of 1903. And he is the patriarch of the family. Uh, he was married um, to Anne Lozier in 
to uh, Mary Lozier, we're going to talk about her in a, in a few minutes. Uh, what was interesting is her maiden name was Thomas. I don't know if you heard me say I was looking for a Thomas flyer at the other museum. So that's going to be something that comes back uh, back to that. Now Harry Lozier, uh, Harry Lozier was his son, sorry about that. Uh, Harry Lozier was his eldest son. He had a total of four children. Uh, none of the other kids were interested in the business that he was in, uh, except Harry. Now, Harry's name really wasn't Harry. It was Henry, Loger, Henry Abram Lozier, Jr. And you have two Harry uh, Lozier, Jr., or I had two Harry Lozier's in the family, and then you had the very son kids. And there was Elizabeth. Uh, she was the second-born kid. Edward Ross Lozier and Joseph Edward Lozier. So that was the family. Now, uh, the story behind all this and how it all came to Plattsburgh, uh, it, well, I'm going to continue with some more people here. John Perrin was the chief engineer. And one of the interesting things is I've had, uh, when I was at the Transportation Museum, I had some people assisting me in trying to figure out all of the family. Where were they? What did they do? And John Perrin was the chief engineer. He was a brilliant man. Uh, when I looked up his history, uh, one, of, one of the pieces of information I found out, he was born in uh, 1880, uh, sorry, let me check my notes here, 1884. And the next thing I looked at, they said he was hired to the Lozier Company in 1883. How could he be hired <laughs> by the company before he was born? So anyway, I, I don't know exactly. I do know he was born in 1884. Uh, he ended up dying uh, in 1967, kind of in the modern times. He lived to be 83 years old. He was a brilliant engineer, and he is one of two people who made the Lozier car, the automobile, as good as it was, as well as the Lozier boats. I don't want to forget the Lozier boats because it's a very important part of this, this story. Uh, the other person is Mr. George Burwell. I don't have his photograph. Uh, George Burwell was uh, the, the plant manager, uh, and uh, we're going to go back a little bit back in time, but uh, the, the story starts out. I'm going to click back here. I made a mistake on this one. So the story starts um, with the Toledo, Ohio plant. And Mr. Henry Lozier was involved in the sewing machine manufacturer business. We would call him today an entrepreneur is what we would because uh, he, well, he was he used to sell. He was the, uh, the lead agent for the New Home Sewing Machine Company. Sewing machines were coming from big factories, they were scaled down, and they were in, in use in the homes. And a lot of ladies found that very, very uh, good that they could make repairs and make their own clothing, and uh, so on and so forth. And uh, maybe a few men also learned how to run them. But anyway, uh, so this was in uh, the Toledo plant. It was a large uh, factory. Uh, let me just go down here for a couple of other slides. Uh, one thing I guess I want to point out with this is this is in Plattsburgh. Uh, the Plattsburgh plant uh, was, very, was very, very popular with the local community. And you can see this is the Lozier baseball team. Uh, we're going to go back to this later. They had the, the band. Uh, this is the band that uh, the went to uh, the big parades around Plattsburgh during the time that they were here. So uh, you can see there's quite a few people there. And the gentleman with the drum, I'm going to talk about his uh, great-grandson in a few minutes, who has written me. Okay, so now we're going to the sewing machine company. And this is an amusing ad uh, that I found for the New Home Sewing Machine Company. I don't know if you could read what it says on the bottom. It shows this lady talking to her husband. And then on the other side, it said, on the left, it says, I will have a new home machine, a painful alternative, a new home, big home or a divorce. Take your choice, sir. <laughs> so I guess um, that's an interesting thing. It shows a picture of it. Looks like every other old trouble type of sewing machine I've ever seen. But anyhow, it's an interesting um, uh, ad uh, for that. So, um, the, and, uh, in 1889, uh, he started selling bicycles on the side. He found bicycles to be, uh, there were a lot of other companies making sewing machines, one being Singer, and that was quite a bit of company. So he started selling bicycles on the side, and uh, very soon uh, he found that he was right in the middle of a huge, popular way to get around town. You think about it, the old days, you might have had to uh, get a horse or a horse and buggy to go any distance. And uh, with the bicycle, you jump on it and away you go. And you can control 
uh, get around different things uh, much easier than a horse. So anyway, uh, he uh, started selling the bicycles on the side, and two years later he joined forces with another sewing machine dealer, Mr. Joseph Yost. Together they purchased the new home factory, changed the name to the Lourdes and Yost Manufacturing Company. In 1889 they changed over to bicycle production. And again, here you go, where, where there's a demand, uh, they want to meet it. So um, the uh, next bicycle here, here, this is the factory in Toledo. You can see up on the top, uh, it was a huge plant making these bicycles. And Mr. Lorger uh, actually had a whole series of plants. Again, I told you he was an entrepreneur. And he ended up with plants in Pennsylvania making uh, bicycle tires and inner tubes. He wanted to control the entire uh, amount of the uh, construction of the, of the vehicle himself. Of course, obviously it makes the most profit that way. So uh, the company was called the Cleveland Bicycle Company. And this is an ad for the Cleveland Bicycle Company. This was uh, appeared in an 1895 newspaper ad. Uh, the bicycle, a few things about the bike. For one thing, it had wooden rims uh, for a little bit better ride. It also had ball bearings. Uh, there's Mr. Perrin. Mr. Perrin, I call him the ball bearing guy. Because if you have a bicycle, you want the tires to easily, the wheels to easily rotate. And so the bicycle did have these ball bearings on them. Uh, he eventually renamed the company the Lozier Manufacturing Company to produce the new Cleveland bicycle. So that was the name of the bicycle. Uh, they were sold all over the United States and over to Europe. In fact, uh, the Cleveland bicycles were sold, uh, oh, I'm sorry, the Lozier Company shipped the very last year that they had this company, 22,000 bicycles to Europe. That's a pretty good output, uh, uh, output of a plan in 1891. So uh, they had the interesting ways of trying to get you to buy the bicycle and to uh, show how the, um, the bicycles are used. And this is one right here. This is a Cleveland bicycle ad. And it's kind of amusing. I hope you can see it, all right? But you see this young lady. Uh, she has her pinafore on. And you see that she's got the bicycle just here, and she's walking across with her high heels across the stones across the river. <laughs> so this is supposedly how light the bicycle was. Well, what they did is they owned the, uh, the American patent on seamless tubing. So our early bicycles were solid steel. These new bicycles right here were hollow, so they were much, much lighter to carry. And that combined with the wood rims made them very, very, um, very easy to get around with. So uh, one of the things that uh, Lozier always did, and a lot of car companies eventually did, was to prove how durable their products were. And here's another ad that I ran into. Uh, this gentleman, <laughs> Mr. Joseph Grimes, he's actually a wrestler. He weighs uh, 575 pounds. And you see this poor gentleman here trying to keep him straight up on his bicycle, but uh, uh, the tires were still had some air in them, it looked like it. But, uh, and I don't think I'd ever want to have to wrestle against him. He looks like a, a force to be reckoned with there. So in 1897, a major change happened. Uh, they, ended, they decided to sell the entire bike, Cleveland bicycle operation. They got a huge offer from the American Bicycle Company and their offer was $4 million. Now this was in 1897. That $4 million today, you'll never guess what that might have translates to, it's $142,800,481.93. That's a huge difference. But if you want to check how wealthy he was, that's how wealthy he was. So the, uh, what they ended up doing, they were building the bicycles, and they decided uh, Mr. Lozier uh, was looking at, he liked boating, he was very interested in boating. And uh, since they, when they sold the bicycle company, uh, the bicycle manufacturing company in Toledo, they had an agreement, they said, we'll, we'll do you a favor. We will continue to run your company for you if you let us use part of your foundry, because we've got a new interest we're interested in. And that was the internal combustion engine for boats. And I'm getting... I'm no. sorry to interrupt you. Do you okay. have that? Oh, it's right here. Okay. Let's you be, well, um, it's... It's, you're saying bicycles and it's saying vegetables. <laughs> so let's, let's try this and see if it... Hello? So much for modern technology. <laughs> That's amazing. Hello? That's right. You just can't understand what I'm saying. Okay, there we go. I, I think... We'll try it and see if it works okay. this way. Right. Yeah, modern technology is great when it works. Yep. Say bicycle. Bicycle. Did you get bicycle? No, it's not working. It's 
Why so? Why so? The one working now. Right? No, you're yeah, no, picking it up from the computer. Oh, I see. Hello. Hello. Are you there? Hello. 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 Is anybody using this? No. I'm not sure. All right. Okay, so the transition from Cleveland, or from uh, Toledo, Ohio. Uh, we are now talking about uh, these marine engines. He had the three people involved with it, which was the was John uh, Perrin and uh, Mr. Burwell. He was the plant manager. So the first engine design that they had at, at the uh, Toledo factory was a one-cylinder, two-cycle, three-horse marine engine. It was a, a very small engine, very dependable. They kept it very simple. It did have roller bearings in it. Uh, and at the time, it was probably the most advanced engine anybody had seen uh, for this time uh, period. Uh, Mr. Burwell was a boat enthusiast and designed the multi-cylinder engines for larger boats. So they were designing more than just the one-cylinder. They, in fact, had a one-cylinder, a two-cylinder, and a four-cylinder engine. The largest was quite large. So uh, they finally met a young man named Scott Matthews. Uh, Scott was a very young man. His father had a, a farm. And what he did is he allowed his son to experiment with woodworking in his barn. And he made some beautiful boats. He said that the most beautiful quality boats they had ever seen. Mr. Lozier was very interested in this because whatever he put his, his hand on, he wanted to make sure it was the best quality you could possibly get. Uh, the boats were built in Bascom, Ohio, which was a little bit south of Toledo. So they decided to come up with an agreement where uh, the boats would be built uh, from 16 to 45 feet long and they would have larger engines. So they were all designed to accept a variety of different larger engines and they would all be marketed under the larger name. This young man, Mr. Uh, Mr. Matthews, had no reputation whatsoever, but Mr. Lozier did. Now remember I told you all these, uh, these bicycles that were shipped to Europe, 20,000 plus bicycles shipped there? He had created a retail environment there. And the idea was not only to produce boats, but also to produce lots of engines and ship them to Europe. There was a demand for high quality engines. So, a new venture uh, started, and I want to, uh, part of this talk, I'm going to have to, I'm going to be reading uh, what are basically um, uh, press releases from the Sentinel, from the Plattsburgh Sentinel, uh, right around the turn of the century. So this is how this is all was happening here in Plattsburgh. The prominent businessmen of Plattsburgh were in search of major a major industry to provide long-term employment for the vast amount of workforce left without jobs as the mining and lumber industries were beginning to fade away. They still had the mines in operation, but they were not putting out a, a huge amount of steel. A gentleman named Mr. Smith Weed, you might have heard that name before, mm -hmm. uh, happened to meet with Mr. Henry Lozier in New York City uh, on one of his many trips there, and he was looking to relocate his business interest from Toledo to another <coughs> city. Uh, they had lots of labor problems in Toledo, so Mr. Weed, uh, being one of the most successful uh, people of the Plattsburgh business people, was instrumental in getting Mr. Lozier interested in Plattsburgh, the Plattsburgh area as a possible site for his factory. Mr. Lozier's superintendent of operations, of course, George, was George Burwell. It just so happened that Mr. Burwell was very familiar with Plattsburgh, as he was. Uh, he was here for two and three quarter years while he was the superintendent of the Williams Typewriter Manufacturing Company here in Plattsburgh. That's down on Pine Street, right near the police station. And there used to be remains uh, along with the wall along the river. So Mr. Lozier made several trips to Plattsburgh to survey the area to meet with local business people who had formed a committee to try to convince Mr. Lozier to relocate his factory here. The efforts were rewarded as in June of 1900, Mr. Lozier announced that Plattsburgh would be the home of the new Lozier Motor Company. During the preceding months before Mr. Lozier's decision, the prominent business people along with some of the citizens of Plattsburgh had pledged various amounts of money to be invested in the company should it be located here. At the time of Mr. Lozier's announcement, the pledge amounted to $104,750. This is at the turn of the century. That's a lot of commitment by local Plattsburgh people to support this company. Mr. George Tuttle, another name you might recognize in Plattsburgh here, 
was appointed chairman of a five-person committee for the Stockholders Association. Mr. Lozier had pledged to match dollar for dollar the amount invested by the citizens. In early July 1900, the Stockholders Committee met with Mr. Lozier to discuss the possible site. There were three locations. The first one was at the intersection of North Margaret Street and Boynton Avenue, known as the Anderson Farm. The Anderson Farm went from Boynton Avenue all the way to Scamotion Creek. For those of you that know, that's quite a bit of land. In fact, it was 285 acres. The second uh, possibility, I never even knew this, was there was an island in the mouth of the Saranac River. Evidently, the river was split there at one point, and there was an island in the center, and they might have produced it or, or had it located there. The other area is known as the South Dock, which is located south of the, uh, at the end of Bridge Street. Basically, what we're talking about is where Peace Point is now. If you go down there, you see where uh, all the sculptures are down there. So it's right, right near the Plattsburgh Bay boat, boat Basin. So Mr. Lozier had secured an option on the Anderson Farm with the owner that would expire August the 6th, 1900. So they were under a little bit of pressure. Do you want the farm or don't you? So what happened, Mr. Lozier also stated at this meeting that the ultimate decision <coughs> would rest entirely with Mr. Burwell because he would be the superintendent of the factory. Mr. Lozier went on to state that the company could not afford to pay anything for the site. By the time the electricity is turned on, we will have spent $50,000, which again, today is a lot of money. So the Anderson Farm property consisted of 285 acres, much of which was lowland and flooded at the lake at certain times of year. Mr. Weed estimated there was 100 good acres of land, and whatever they didn't use, they could sell. Uh, the property, um, he's also stated the property not used could be sold for building lots. And the price of the property was $11,000. So at this meeting, uh, Mr. Lozier announced, let me go to the next slide here. He announced uh, that the contract for the dam and powerhouse at Indian Rapids. Now this part you might not have seen. I don't know if I had how much I had of this if you did come uh, to the 2018 lecture. But uh, the problem was there was not enough power in Plattsburgh to run this factory operation because they did their own, they, they had the, uh, they melted their own metal. They had a huge operation there. So what was required was a factory rate of this uh, power plant. Now, for those of you who don't know where this is, you can actually see it. Uh, it is located, if you go to where the airport is, if you come out of the new airport on Route 22, take a left, and you go along, you'll see a, a, a guardrail right along the edge, and then you, the guardrail breaks right there for a minute. That's an old fishing hole, and I'm gonna show you what you're gonna see if you go down there in just a minute. The ruins are still there. So this, uh, the contract was awarded uh, to a Mr. Del a Dennis Callahan of Plattsburgh for the amount of $19,818.23. Both the dam and the powerhouse would be built of concrete. The, co the contract for the electro machine would, would be let out in a few days. The powerhouse will consist of two generators of 500 horsepower each and a transmission line carrying a current of 10,500 volts to the shops, which were right down Morton Avenue. And a lot of people complain because the thing used to hump when they were running the factory and all the electricity was going down there. So where it would be transformed to 240 volts for the purpose of running the machinery. Uh, Prattsburg Daily Press, Bolton, September 14, 1900. Amelia A. Anderson and others sold to the Lowinger Motor Company, Plattsburgh Village property for one dollar and other considerations. The other considerations were stock in the company. Plattsburgh Sentinel, September 21st, 1900. Ground is broken for the boathouse. Now, uh, just so you're aware, when you're talking about this, uh, this is the only known surviving photograph of what this uh, powerhouse looked like. And like I said, this, uh, what you can see here, uh, what's very white there, was obviously taken in the wintertime. That's where the dam is actually across, and the building there with the windows on it, the water flows through that building, and that's where the generators are, and the sluice ways are here. So uh, we're going to go down here and take a little bit better look. This is what it looks like today. Uh, we, uh, the, the dam is to the right. The, the remains of the building are to the left, and you can walk right down to there. If you don't want to go down there, if you go up on the north way, if you go to the mobile station, get on the northbound way, uh, the north way, and you look just before the bridge, you'll actually see this dam here. You'll see the, the center part of it. So this is the water coming out. Uh, he said they tell me it's very good fishing there. 
And there's the opening of the dam. That's what you'll see from the north way. You can actually see the break in the dam. Uh, this is where the water goes into the dam that was for the power. And these gates are partly down. But that's what it looks like today. So now I want to talk about uh, the construction that went on here. Uh, Henry Lozier now, uh, things changed a little bit because Henry Lozier moved to New York City to establish a sales headquarters with a new showroom on the East River where the new boats were on display and a boathouse with the launches tied up to docks ready to take you for a ride right in New York City. They were on the East River. Henry and his wife, Mary, lived in a luxurious suite at the Waldorf Astoria in Manhattan. So you see all this money he got from the sale of his bicycles, he decided to live the good life. The Lozier Marine engines were shipped and sold throughout the world. You could find Lozier Marine engines in Egypt, China, Japan, India, England, Scotland, Sweden, and Australia. So they got around the world. Here's the major thing that happened. Henry Abram Lozier died on May 25, 1903 at his apartment at the Waldorf. His obituary read in the New York Times, said May 26, 1903. Henry A. Lozier, ex-president of the Cleveland Bicycle Company, died suddenly from heart failure yesterday afternoon in his 66th year of his age. Though feeling unwell yesterday morning, Mr. Lozier refused the services of a physician as he th did not believe his condition was serious. Mr. Lozier was born in Dearborn County, Indiana, when the bicycle industry was in its infancy. He entered the field by purchasing the sewing machine plant at Toledo, Ohio, and making bicycles there. He later established factories in other cities and at one time employed over 4,000 men. As the industry declined, he directed his energies to other lines. He was then the president of the Boulay Spectacular Art Company. So you can see he got around, he did a lot of stuff. Okay, so um, this is the layout uh, that they came up with for the Plattsburgh plant. Now what you're looking at on well, Margaret Street, I'll use my little pointer here if I can get it right, Margaret Street is right along here, Boynton Avenue is this way here, and Cumberland Avenue is this way. Uh, so the first building to be built was right here. This is the, uh, the called the Boat House. It's still called the Boat House by Georgia Pacific now. And right across the street, you've got Margaret Street here. You see these trade tracks right across. And this right here was the, uh, the foundry and the uh, woodworking shop. So this is where they cut the wood up for the boats. And over here was what they call the machine shop. So that's where the engines would have been built. After all the parts were machined, they were built over there. So this is the surveyor's map of the plasma plant. Uh, the next slide we have here uh, it shows the whole complex. Uh, and we're going sideways now. Sorry for the confusion, but the writing is all this way. So what you have here is Mark, whoops. Go here again. Uh, Margaret Street is running here. Now, you know, this is Boynton Avenue, and this is Cumberland Avenue. The boathouse is here. And you can see the boats were shipped right out into the lake where they were test driven. The, this is the foundry over here. And what they did, uh, this was actually, this slide is from 1905, so this is wrong a little bit bigger. But over here, this is where they expanded the machine shop area. And they were getting ready to build cars here. This building over here was a finishing shop for the wood because the wood inside these larger boats was beautiful. And that's where they did the final finishing before they were brought to the, uh, to the boathouse for a final completion. So this is what the boathouse looked like in 1900. This is the oldest photograph we've ever seen of it. And I will tell you, I was in there Thursday. I spent uh, about three hours uh, Thursday. We're going to talk about this uh, towards the end. But uh, the boathouse is all made out of wood. I thought it was steel. And everybody, always when they talk about the boat, they, they look about the south, they look at it, see how it's slighted on the sides? That's on purpose. It's got great big timbers running down the side to prevent it from moving once the big crane is in there. And there is a 10-ton steam-powered crane in there. I got some photographs of that. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. So this is the, the boathouse. Okay, um, let's get another one. This is the interior of the boathouse. Uh, it looks a little different because now you would have been on the first floor. They put a new floor that basically runs right across here. So when I was in, I was up in this area over here. There's the 10-ton the crane, uh, and it, again, it's powered by steam. Here's the railroad track. So what they would do is bring the trains, right, uh, railroad flatbed cars in, haul the trains out, and if they had any wood, they had to bring in. That's how they would do it. These are a picture. Uh, this is a picture taken at the very end of the building, would be the west end of the building. 
and here's the Mosier launches. Uh, they didn't sell them in round plasma. You could probably buy one directly from the factory, but uh, the closest sales place was Albany. And a lot of them, most of them were shipped to New York City, and a few were shipped all over the country. So this is outside. This is the boathouse here on the right. This is the boathouse with the exhibit there. And you can see these right here are Delaware and Hudson rail, rail cars that were used to ship the boats. Delaware and Hudson was very important to this company and to the entire Plattsburgh area. This is what the boat would look like. This is called the launch. Uh, this one right here is probably a 22-footer. Uh, you can see this little engine in the center. This is the, the three horsepower engine. It would move the boat right along. It could go around 20, 25 miles an hour with it. Uh, so it was, uh, it was pretty powerful for what it was. These uh, things here, these gunwales around, uh, you would have canvas strapped around there, and if it got a little bit too rowdy on the lake, you just put the canvas up and you wouldn't get wet. At least not very wet, anyway. So uh, this right here, uh, this is what the engine actually looked like. This is a three horsepower marine engine. You can see the flywheel on the front of it. Uh, and it says right on it, it says the Lozier uh, three horsepower engine built in Plattsburgh, New York, right on the plate. Uh, the plaque is right up there in the front of the engine. Uh, this is what the actual boat, this is a real boat, and by the way, this was on display at the Transportation Museum and it's now for sale. Uh, it is uh, not powered by the three horsepower engine, it has a modern marine engine in it, but this is a beautiful example, so the boat and the trailer are for sale. I'm not trying to sell it, it's not mine, but just in case everybody's interested, that's what it is. So uh, this is an interesting photograph, and this is taken at Smithweed Park. So uh, the uh, Smithweed Mansion would have been right up here on the hill. It was at one time the American Legion. It's on the corner of Sally Avenue and uh, Cumberland Avenue. And these two boats here, uh, they did make boats, uh, big ones. Uh, this one here, I don't know the length of it. It's probably closer to a 30-footer. And this is a little smaller one, but these are cabin boats. And these would have had a two-cylinder or a four-cylinder engine. This is the biggest one. This is a 30 horsepower marine engine, and uh, this is the biggest one that they, they made. Uh, and this would have been for the much, much larger boats. Okay. Uh, I'm going to move up just to see where I'm at. Okay, well, here's an interesting shot. This is the Boston Boat Show in 1905. Look how they actually built a lake in the middle of this big hall, the big show hall. And if you wanted to ride in the larger boat, they're there lined up there. They take you a ride around the auditorium. And over here you see the larger sign and the various variety of motors. There's a little three so a one cylinder engine over there. So they really did advertise these boats. Uh, this is a, the heating plant. Uh, water came from Lake Champlain. I remember when I was young, the, uh, the chimney was there for a long time, a brick chimney. They finally took it down because it was kind of dangerous. Uh, this is the woodworking shop and the foundry. Uh, you really can't see much of it today because they bricked almost all of it in. This right here would be on Morton Avenue, and there's a big, what they call a digester in the front of it. This is the front of it, so this is, you're standing on Margaret Street, and you can see the train tracks here as they come around uh, over to the other side. So this would have been the, uh, the um, woodworking shop and the foundry. This is the interior. We have a, the, one of the few rare photographs of the interior of it. You can see the molds they had and the, the engines that are being built in it. Now, this is a building that was built around 19, uh, just before 1905, uh, and, and the addition to the side of it. And that building all still exists today. If you stop in front of, you're not supposed to stop in front of the Georgia Pacific plant, but if you do, and you look across the street, all the windows are bricked in. The only thing you can see is the very end of the building right now. Now, this uh, is an interesting scene. You see, this photograph was taken, if you look at the corner here, this was taken in 1905. It said, this is my office right here. That was his office. This is our machine shop. And I had a letter, I, or an email, I should say, I received from Mr. John Wiley. And this, his grandfather, Harry Clinton Tyler, worked in the plant, and he was the drummer, I should have joined the band. So local people are still in contact with us. And uh, that's the outside of the building. And the next slide here, this is the inside. So the weird thing here is that you've got like an inside and an outside on the inside. In other words, this looks like you're standing outside of the building, but you're actually inside the actual plant itself. And then his office would have been up there on the right. 
These are just other pictures. You can see the uh, big electric motors turning all these belts, which were in all the equipment. These are just snapshots so you can see what it did look like. The floors are all wood. Here's the steam uh, powered. There's two, two of these. This is the one in the machine shop, the steam powered crane. And here's the main office. And you notice it looks like a house, because it is. It's a house. Except when they spec'd it, they wanted two front porches. There's one on the north side, and if you were on the other side, it looks exactly the same on the south side. And you might also notice the little widow walk, they call them, on the top. Uh, that's where they could see the boats running out on Lake Champlain, so they could keep track of what they were doing. This is a, an interesting postcard, and you can see all the uh, workers out here working, so it was based on the photograph. And that's a picture there of the house. This is Margaret Street. Notice it's all dirt. There's no paving. And this is a larger test car, so we're getting into the cars, and I'm going to talk about the cars for a minute. From 1905 to 1915, with the death of his father, Harry Lodger, George Burwell, and John Perrin had to decide the future director of the company. Harry had long opposed the production of the automobile, citing the problems with early cars and questioning the results of placing the larger <coughs> name on a product that would most often require a mechanic or a driver or a chauffeur, uh, that, uh, to assure you would arrive at your destination. After meeting with the board of directors, it was decided that intensive s research was required to obtain the finest quality materials and proceed with the development of the larger automobile. George Burwell and John Perrin set out to discover Europe to find out how other manufacturers had been engineering their cars and began to set a set of standards for their own product. There was a fun, how do you do it? We're going to do it better. It was obvious that cars built in Europe were built of superior materials. That's one of the big things. Uh, Henry Ford found that out when he finally switched to vanadium steel. That was a high quality product, even though he had a, a cheap car, the foundation was important to it. It was determined that there were, they, these automobiles were the finest quality available at the time, and at a base price of 30000 these were the Mercedes. The Mercedes they found was the highest quality they could find over there. Uh, they were also the most expensive they found in Europe. He went on undercover to work on Mercedes cars and sent the results back to Plattsburgh. The goal was to produce an automobile that was equal in quality and value of the finest of the European designs. Harry had the assurance from Burwell and Perrin that the final product would make his father proud. Like I said, the father was resistant to cars. He was going to uh, make sure that it was um, as good. The prototype car uh, was brought to Madison Square Garden. Uh, auto show in 1905. Unlike Packard and Cadillac, which featured a one-cylinder engine, it had a four-cylinder engine, 115-inch wheelbase, and 36-inch wheels. It featured an aluminum body and dimensions that were larger than most vehicles on the road. The car was designated the Model B, the reason being the first one was the production, the uh, experimental car. And by the time they put it into production, they made a whole bunch of improvements to it. The base price $4,500. The average person made around $700 a year. So it's a very expensive car. Virtually every possible part was produced at the Plattsburgh factory that they could do. Okay, other parts uh, used the Krupp steel. Bosch magnetos were imported from Germany, because that was the best you could buy. The ignition and equipment and the carburetors came from France. Each automobile, uh, let me just move on to the slide here. Each automobile was test driven uh, 500 miles through the demanding Adirondack Mountains for break-in and then disassembled and reassembled again to assure the best reliability. Mm -hmm. Now this car right here was one of the first cars they were using uh, and if you look at the car you can see that it's not a complete car. And there was the car, the entire car was not built here in Plattsburgh, only the mechanical parts to it. So what they did, they had a series of hoods and fenders they would put on the car and then they would test it. It went all the way down Route 9 to Osable Forks, and then it went up around the Adirondacks. They had to put 500 miles before the car was completely done. It took several days of driving. So they had a whole team of test drivers, and here they are. Uh, we think this picture might have been taken along Route 9. And you can see the car they're uh, driving. This is more of a production model. Uh, the way you can tell of that is the curved fender. So that's a, more of a production fender. And you can see there's no windshield, and you can see what they were having. They have goggles on and long overcoats, so this might have been in the winter time. So these people were pretty tough back in the day. The completed chassis of the cars were, um, were uh, shipped. Once they were done, just like the boats were, they were put on a, a flatbed 
and they were uh, taken down to New York, to New Jersey, and the Quinby Carriage Company was the one company in Newark, New Jersey, where all the bodies were built. Okay, and then the cars were retailed around all around the United States. They were available in Detroit. Uh, they were they were sold in California. Uh, Boston had a had a big uh, the Boston uh, showroom was one of the biggest on the East Coast. Well, this right here is a photograph of a 1905 Lozier Briarcliff, and the one unique thing about it, you notice that there's no there isn't a windshield on here because there was no safety glass. It wasn't until around 1908 that they finally came up with glass dependable enough. So when you had your car, it was pretty much an open air car. And you can see the convertible top is folded here in the back, you would bring that up. Uh, so this is a 1905 Lozier Briarcliff. Each year that new models were introduced, uh, in this case right here, this is, a, this is another uh, 1905 seven passenger car. You see these young ladies all on it, you see a total of six Ladies, there are three in the back seat, there are two on the jump seat, one in the front, of course you have the driver in the front. And this is pretty much how the cars were driven at the time. This one here is a touring car, and it has a very odd thing. If you look at the car on the running board, you're going to see this, oops, let me bring it back here. Uh, you'll see this weird little thing here on the fender. That is the chauffeur's seat. These are very wealthy people, and if the driver brought, the chauffeur brought the car for the gentleman to drive, he would have to sit on this seat on the fender. That was uh, being an employee. Things were not quite the way they are today. So this would be a 1905 touring car. You can see they have a bit of a towel to direct the air up over you, but otherwise it's a completely open car. There is a top. This is the car I saw at the Bill Harbor Museum. That's the picture I took of it. And this is the oldest surviving Lozier in, in, in existence. All of the 1905 cars have been lost. And this is the only 1906 Lozier. Uh, all right, so I got this picture. This is the one that really got me. It's a white car. Uh, you can see it does have a windshield. It might have been put on at a later time, but around 1908, they were regularly putting windshields on, but they were optional. And you can see the top is up. And uh, this, they, this does not have a filter seat. That was an option. This is another photo. You can see the original uh, sign I took a picture of, and then we can see it's a 1906 Lozier, $5,500 uh, retail price. Okay, racing. Uh, each year that new models were introduced features and advances, and, and advances in engineering, mostly due to the chief engineer, John Perrin, and his design team. Uh, features and uh, improved, the prices continued to rise. The model C and D had a longer wheelbase, four-speed transmission, and a larger motor. The prices were $5,500 for the touring car and $6,500 for the limousine. 90, 1906 production increased to, uh, by the way, 25 cars the first year, 1905, 56 cars the second year, and only one survives. A new showroom, a new luxurious showroom was built on 56th Street and Broadway to sell them, as well as a showroom in Boston. The 1907 model, um, we go back to the slide for a second. A 1907 model E was produced with a price tag of $7,000 for the touring car, $8,000 for the limousine. You see what's happening. They're getting more and more expensive, more and more features. The new car was built on a 120-inch wheelbase and had a 60-horsepower engine. To match the country club pricing, the car models were named after affluent communities, clubs, hotels, and streets, such as the Meadowbrook, the Lakewood, the Riverside, and the Knickerbocker. The year 1907 was the start of larger involvement with automobile racing. Racing on closed tracks uh, in the United States began in 1900. Uh, the uh, 1907 is when, is when Lozier started. And uh, the first race involving Lozier's was at Breeze Point, Philadelphia, one mile horse track on June the 28th and 29th of 1907. And these are the cars that raced. It was a 24 hour race starting at noon on the 28th, ending on uh, starting on the 28th, ending at noon on the 29th. The dirt tracks turned into a sea of mud after raining for 10 hours of the 24 hours. Should have been fun. The drivers were Harry Mister and Ralph Mulford. Lozier cars were involved in 21 major races from 1907 till the end of 1911. The most famous race was the Indy 500 auto race held on Memorial Day, May the 30th, 1911. 
40 cars met the minimum qualifying speed of 75 miles an hour. When the checkered flag dropped, the loser was declared the winner. However, the second place car, the Marmon Wasp, which was built in Indianapolis, Indiana, the hometown boys, said that they had their car had passed the loser, uh, uh, passed the loser during the pit stop, and no one was able to uh, refute this, this. So the boys, uh, the the mar the rate, uh, sorry, the Marmon Wasp was the winner. The uh, Indianapolis boys did good at their home track, so they won the first race. But Loser was second. That's still quite a, a feat. And this is car number 33. Uh, you can see it at the track. It doesn't look anything like the Indy 500 now. Okay, so I'm gonna, we're going to talk about Mary uh, Melissa Lo Thomas Loger. Uh, I had mentioned before her father was uh, Edwin Ross Thomas. In 1902, this is the, her father was, of course, the father-in-law to Henry Lo Loger. And he started building cars in 1903. Uh, his car was called the Thomas, uh, the Thomas Flyer. And in, now I want you to think about this for care care. You know what the winters were like here. In February the 12th of 1908, they decided to have the great race around the world. Has anybody ever heard of this before? I, I, I did, and uh, this is one of the reasons why I wanted to see the Thomas. So what they did, they started in New York, right here. They raced up to Albany. They went all the way across to Chicago and then to San Francisco, okay? Uh, this was February the 12th, 1908. The cars that were entered were from Germany, France, Italy, and the United States. There were four cars. The race was sponsored by the New York Times and La Matin, the Paris newspaper. The torturous route, uh, uh, New York to Paris route, uh, New York City, Albany, Chicago, San Francisco, Seattle, then to Valdez, Alaska, the original plan was for them to go across the, go to Valdez, drive across Alaska, and the Bering Straits would be frozen, and they would go into Russia. <laughs> and then they would continue over, eventually landing in Paris. That was the original plan. The United States portion right here, from New York to San Francisco, took 41 days, 8 hours, and 15 minutes, New York to San Francisco. This is in 1908, driving a 1907 car. The teams covered three continents and over 22,000 miles in 169 days. The race was ultimately won by the American-made Thomas Flyer, driven by George Schuster of Buffalo, New York. This, this feat has never been equaled, and they still hold the world record 100 years later. So if you want to go, try this race, try the same the way they did it. Now they did run into the problem, once they ran into the problem of the the Bering Strait, they brought the boat, the, my boat, they went back to Seattle, they shipped it to Yokohama, Japan, and then Vladivostok, Russia, and then up through, I can't even pronounce that, in Tustik or whatever, Omsk and Moscow. <laughs> so here we go, we're going to go with them with the race. Here is Manhattan. You see the cars are all lined up here. Uh, those three cars, well, I'm not sure which is which, one is the German, one the Italian. Uh, the American car is not in sight there. Uh, here is a, uh, when they're, um, this is the Thomas car, and you can see for protection, all they had was the head fenders, and all you can see this hoop, and if there was a canvas top, all they did was pull it over them if it rained, that's it, and off they went. So this is in February, so it must have been pretty, it was not as cold in New York as it is here, but it was pretty bad. So this is, uh, this is at Utica, New York, and notice they've got, uh, up here in the front, they've got tire chains on the front for <laughs> stability. And they put some sort of a cloth here to keep their legs from mud from getting up on their legs and so on. Uh, here are all four of the cars. You see the car with the U.S. flag, that's the Thomas. Uh, and you can see the snow. I'm not sure where this location is, but this is part of the race. Over here, they went up to, when they did bring the boat of the cars up to Valdez, Alaska, a bunch of people wanted to pose with the car and drive it. So here are four young ladies taking the uh, the Thomas car for a ride. And mm -hmm. you can see all the snow piled up on the side and everybody, it was like a parade. So back on the boat it went. Uh, this is the boat heading across uh, from San Francisco to uh, Japan. And here we are in Japan. You can see all the city goers coming out. Many of them maybe never saw a car before. What I want to know is where did they get gas? <laughs> there was no McDonald's, so they had to provide their own food somehow or somehow or other. So it was an interesting race. Uh, this is, they took a break here, you can see the American flag on the back of the car, and uh, you can see pieces missing now, the rear fenders are gone, so they had a pretty rough time. 
Now this is one point they had all the cars had to go across this. There was a, a fairly large river they had to cross, and there happened to be a train track, and this was part of the scheduled trip. Except, we'll talk about that in a minute. So here is the uh, the Thomas getting across a muddy area to the other side. You think it's bad when you have to go to drive around here in Plattsburgh in the snow? Can you imagine what they put up with all this time? Here is the final uh, arrival uh, when the car arrived in Paris. You can see the cars kind of beat up. The boards, by the way, on the side were used as ramps when they had to get up some steep uh, uh, ramps. I told you I went to the Harvard Museum to see this car, and here it is. You can see it yourself. It's in the National Automobile Museum. Uh, the car was neglected for a long time. In fact, it got rusty and it was almost falling apart. And the Bill Harvard Car Museum restored it to what you see here today. And this is exactly what the car looked like once it arrived in Paris. Uh, you can see the upholstery is exactly the same. You can see the, the back there, that's the gas tank. This car here is called the Lorger Briarcliff Racer. Now what this is, this is a stock street automobile. Remember I told you the Lorgers were stock. If you wanted to race them, you raced them. And then this particular car is owned by Mr. Corey Coker. He actually sells uh, antique tires for these cars. You can buy the, almost any car you can think of, you can buy tires for them. This is what the car looks like after you take the fenders off. And in fact, they did a, a great race in 19, or 2003. They actually had a competition, and there it is, uh, the, the car set up for road racing on roads. Of course, it was, the roads were closed off for this race. Now, uh, we're going to talk about uh, 1908. Uh, I picked this car right here of all of them because you can see the beautiful quality of this car. Uh, this one's painted burgundy. You can see the uh, red chassis underneath. Brass, all of this stuff was brass on here. Uh, this one has the windshield. It's sloped back slightly for slight aerodynamics. And you notice that it's right drive. All the cars we've seen so far are right drive. The first left-hand drive was Henry Ford's the Model T in 1908. He was the first one to come out with that. Loser did a couple of years later. So this particular car here, uh, they had chain drive prior to this. Now this is the shaft drive. The headlights are, are carbide. There's a carbide tank down underneath. And these are the headlights, you had to light them before you went out at night. Uh, this is the uh, engine compartment uh, of that car. And if you can see all the brass, now this car has just been restored. So this is what the car engine would look like when you first got it. The engine uh, heads, all these heads here, are porcelain enamel. They actually baked them in enamel before they did the machining. So it stayed nice and clean under the hood, if you kept it polished and cleaned up. Okay, so. Uh, it was determined in 1909 that the Plattsburgh plant did not have the capacity to produce over 500 cars a year. The plant was operating, operating at, at maximum capacity. Uh, after attempting to secure financing to expand the plant, the larger team were convinced that they needed outside capital to continue. After failing to secure a loan for the bankers in New York City, a group of Detroit businessmen and investors convinced Mr. Lozier that his car could give the Packard which at the time was one of the most expensive cars, a run for its money. They provided the capital needed, and a multi-million dollar ultra-modern plant was built in Detroit. Now the new plant in Detroit, you can see these, uh, the inside of the plant, this is the drawing of it, so parts would go down the line. It was kind of an assembly line, and then when the parts, when the, the parts would be fed to this part, and then the final car would come out the end of the plant here. And this is what the plant looked like. Now this is, uh, this is two drawings here. The top one, this is the Detroit plant, and this is the Plattsburgh plant. So uh, you saw us talking, I talked about the, um, uh, the layout of the plant. This right here is the boathouse, right here. Uh, this is the, uh, the heating plant. This is the house they had for the sales headquarters. This is the machine shop with all the addition to the side of it. And this is the original foundry. Uh, this is Boynton Avenue and Cumberland Avenue and uh, Margaret Street right here. Uh, this. Uh, uh, so this is the, basically the plan. Now the, uh, this is the Detroit factory again. Uh, Mr. Albert Kahn was the designer of this and he had designed the Ford Motor Company. So they decided when well, they were going to do this plant, they were going to do it upright. With the Plattsburgh plant, the Detroit plant was capable of producing two, 1,200 cars a year, up from about four to 500. In 19, this is an interesting fact, in 1910, 
There were 54 automobiles registered in Plattsburgh and four were loaders. And I'm sure Mr. Smith, we, since he has these boat loader boats, he probably had that too. So this would have been a new factory. Uh, this is a, an example of the, one of the ads for Lozier. Uh, you can see uh, the choice of men who know. And uh, the idea was, they, one of their models was, if you want to know the quality of a Lozier, just ask someone who owns one, they'll tell you. This is the Lozier of one of the ads. This is one of the actual ads uh, that came out of Detroit, Mac Avenue, Detroit. And this is the Champlain Hotel, right over here, right on the road here at Lowe's. You can see the, uh, the, the original hotel before it burned. This car here is an interesting car because uh, I had the luck of going to the, uh, the Gilmore Museum. And this car was in the Gilmore Museum. This is a 1910 Lozier Briarcliff. And now notice the colors. The car is actually red, white, and blue. You see the under fenders are red. You've got the body, or the body, the up, the main part of the body with passengers is blue. Lots of brass, a lot of wood. And the chauffeur seat, of course, is over here. Now, I had a chance to take a lot of photographs of this car, and one of the things I did is uh, I, there was a plaque on the side of it, and it said FOB Detroit. So I started looking, this thing is coming apart here, so oh, this, uh, this car uh, said FOB Detroit. I, had a, I have a whole bunch of photographs of the uh, Detroit factory, and it wasn't ready to build cars. This car was actually had to have built, built in Plattsburgh and shipped to Detroit, and it was the, one of the first cars that went off. Now this car, we call, they, they call this car the Titanic Connection, and I'll, I'll tell you in a second about this. Here's a close-up of the chauffeur seat. It just seems like torture to have your chauffeur sitting out there, but that was the way things were. So uh, this particular loger was owned by Helen and Dixon Bishop, and they were on the Titanic. Uh, when the Titanic sank in 1912, they survived. They were newlyweds. That was one of the categories, one of the few men that were allowed to get on the boat. If you were there with your wife and you were newlywed, you got to get on the lifeboat, and they came back, and they were picked up in their car from the train uh, with this Lozier car. And they donated this to the, uh, to the museum. This is a photograph of a 1911 Lozier. Now, as we get the cars a little bit newer, you notice that what's happening is the cars are less ostentatious. What they did is all this brass was considered to be showy. You had to polish it all the time. If you didn't polish it, it looked awful. So what they did is they used nickel plating. This is an example of the side marker lights uh, with the nickel plating and paint. And you see there's still gold, gold uh, pinstriping on it to make it look nice. Nineteen twelve brought a major change to the shift to left-hand drive. Uh, Henry Ford beat them to it with 1908 with a Model T, and so the new car was called the Model 72 with a base price of $5,000 and a six-cylinder engine. Uh, the base, uh, the uh, four-cylinder engine was dropped. This is the trunk in the back, and this is the kind of trunk you can pick up and bring into your house. You can pack it in your house, put it on the back, and when you get where you're going, bring it into the hotel. Now here's where all the trouble starts happening for the company. In 1912, model year brought a major change. Oh, I'm sorry. Henry Ford, uh, Henry Lozier, this is Harry, Harry Lozier, was ousted from his position as the president and given a position on the board of directors. Okay, so his father had died. Uh, he was kicked out of the company. Uh, he was replaced by Mr. Harry M. Jewett, one of the original Detroit investors. So now you have the board of directors taking over the company. Uh, so the man, one of the men responsible for this wonderful quality car is not, not no longer the chairman of the company, he's on the board. Jewett announced the introduction of a new car called the Model 77. The new car was called the Light 6 with an L-head engine and 36 horsepower. The car had a price of $3,250. See what's happening? All your quality is gone. The, larger, the bearing, ball bearings that we had on these cars are no longer on there. And they've reduced the price down uh, to try to uh, get more sales. But you've got to remember the reputation that Henry Lozier wanted when it, in his cars. There was a large demand for the Model 72, the last of the Grand Lozier passed. But right in the middle of production, Jewett resigned and was replaced by Joseph Gilbert, a general manager of the U.S. Tire Company. Immediately, Gilbert switched policy and demanded a new 4 be built. It was called the Type 84, where the price, instead of $3,250, is $2,100. You see where they're going? They're going down in price and down in quality. 
Now, this is an interesting picture because there had always been a rumor in 1912 that they would be building a truck. And this is the front of the truck right here. I have a whole bunch of pictures of this. You can see it's chain drive. The tires are solid because uh, this is a five ton truck. The tires uh, could not be pneumatic at that time. They didn't have tires uh, strong enough to support a truck. Now here is a car I ran into. This is in, in Moscow, in a museum in Moscow. This is a 1913 loader. And notice now it's gone over to left hand drive. And the car really doesn't look like those cars they used to have with those real high prices. The, um, in 1914, Cadillac introduced a new V8 powered car at a price of $2,000. There was competition from Cadillac, Packard, and other manufacturers. The loss of prestige with a new pricing structure and reduced product production brought the company to the brink. The chief engineer, John Perrin, went to work for Pratt & Whitney Aircraft. The Lozier Company closed down its doors in late August for reorganization. Every attempt was made to reopen, including trying to entice Henry Ford to take over. On December 7th, the Lozier was forced to declare insolvency, and a bankruptcy sale was set for February 4th, 1915. A group of investors formed the Association of Lozier Purchases for the purposes of reopening the company. For a short time, they were successful, but eventually the company was put to rest. The Plattsburgh plant was sold at auction on May 25th. There were no lamentations for the death of the car of excellence had died long before. Some speculators believe that if Lozier had might have lasted, uh, had, had production been limited to here, Plattsburgh, and the Adirondacks. Okay, the story is not over yet. This is a left-hand drive Lozier, by the way. Uh, this is a 1913. So this is the last of these big cars. They were produced up until 1913. That was the last of these cars. The 1914 Roadster. <coughs> the story is not over yet. Well, anyway, we're going to talk about these two. This right here is the car we had at the Transportation Museum. This is a 1914 <laughs> Roadster Type 77. This is the cheaper car. You can tell it's still a pretty special looking car. I don't know if anybody's seen it, but it is quite a large automobile. Uh, by any standards. So this is the 1914, and this is the also the 1915. Now you notice they went into receivership and they lasted till February. This is the one of only two Lozier's that exist today. This is Dr. Vaccaro's car. It was his car. He sold it. But uh, this, you can see the car, uh, the large engine here in the front. You can see the uh, jump seats in there, the size of the wheels, and there are some other options on here that I'll show you. Uh, this is the engine. You can see the electric starter. You had an electric alternate or, or generator to have electric, electric headlights. Uh, oil level indicator. You didn't have to get your hands dirty to check your oil. All you do is you look at this little indicator, see how much oil is left in your pancake. You didn't, didn't have to, uh, to check it with a, a uh, paper towel. This is the air compressor. You can blow up your own tires. This was an option on Lozier. All you have to do is turn that lever and hook up your air, air to it. You can blow up your tires or someone else's without having to go to a gas station. This car also had hydraulic shock absorbers. And on the back is this neat little thing. If anybody, I don't know if anybody's seen it, some of you are recognizing it, might have been to the museum. Uh, this one had a unique little trunk, and the purpose of this trunk is for refreshments for a long time. <laughs> okay, so um, uh, the story's not over. Uh, once all this went on, the plant was sold, and Harry Lozier was upset at the board of directors. He was on the board of directors. Uh, he could see his company being taken away from him. He could see failure heading in the future. So what he decided to do is form a new company, the H.A. Lozier Company of Cleveland, Ohio. The prototype car had a V12 engine. He was, again, he was thinking of his father. Cadillac has a V8. We'll have a V12. And... That appeared at where the first Lozier was shown in the New York Auto Show in January 1916. The car was called the HAL 12. Production of the $2,100 car commenced early that summer, although the price would eventually rise as time went on. The company was located in the former World Tourist Factory. Harry Lozier left the company in the fall of that year due to health reasons. The company was called the HAL Motor Company, so if you're ever looking uh, for these cars, and this is an ad for it in Cleveland, Ohio. <clears throat> this is the only photograph I've seen of a HAL car. They're apparently pretty scared for them. 
Uh, the company bro state, uh, brochure stated that even though the engines were rated at 40 horsepower, they actually produced over 70. So they tried to give you the value back with this big V12 engine, and what it produced 100 horsepower at 3,000 uh, 3, RPM. Among the prominent owners uh, of Hal's was Warren G. Harding, the president. Uh, World War, I'm sorry, World War, the World War I resulted in material shortages which affected the production. The Hal was petitioned into bankruptcy in February 1917, and the assets were auctioned off in April. Henry Harry Abram, Jr., or, or, uh, died one day after Christmas on December 26, 1926. These are other pictures of the Hal. And this is the headstone for Henry, the senior, uh, in Cleveland. He and his wife, uh, Mary, are, are buried in Cleveland. And this is, uh, this is Harry, Henry Abram, Jr. And he's buried with his wife, Elizabeth. Uh, the Lozier cars were <clears throat> large, comfortable, and powerful with ex elegant design and with mechanical excellence of roller bearings and every possible rotating part. Very expensive to build and were marked legitimately high, high priced as per the company uh, logo. So I want to have a little bit of a postscript here. I want to tell you one more thing uh, about uh, the situation we have here. Uh, you see these photographs. It took me 15 years to put a lot of this together. I've had people assisting me by telling me names of people that worked here. And the nice thing is now uh, belonging to the board of the uh, Clinton County Historical Association, all of this stuff will be archived there. So 75 years, from there, they're celebrating the 75th or 76th anniversary, I guess that is now? 76th anniversary, uh, almost as old as I am. And uh, the thing is, they, uh, anything that is kept here, hopefully it will be around for another 75 years. I'll tell you what is not going to be kept. Remember I mentioned the Lozier Boathouse? It is being demolished, just so you know. Uh, the building is, belongs to Georgia Pacific. It is in really rough shape. I spent last Thursday three hours inside the building. Uh, uh, Karen's uh, son, uh, Jed, uh, flies a drone, and we flew the drone inside the building to get a good look at the, uh, at the uh, steam uh, engine and so on and so forth. And this is how, and this is all digital, I guess is what he's doing, and this is how we could preserve the future. Someday, 75 years from now, you'll probably go back and take a look at the drone footage uh, that was shot last Thursday. So we preserved, we did some aerial shots of the building so we know what the whole plant looks like today. There's nothing you can do to stop a situation like this. The factory is, in, you know, this particular building is in very bad shape and very soon, probably the late in the summer, you'll see it coming down. And I thank you folks very much for listening to me. I hope I didn't put you to sleep, but uh, one, of the, thank you very much. one of the things that uh, I'd like to make sure is that you please come to the museum. Uh, we have some new exhibits up. Uh, the military gallery has been redone. We have a new exhibit on the prohibition. Um, very interesting, a lot of fun to be in that room. Has anybody been there yet in that room? It's, uh, we have a player piano uh, and so on. And we have a new exhibit upstairs. Uh, the 75 years of collecting, celebrating the 75th anniversary uh, of the museum, and in the uh, the industry and art, what in the industry, business, in, business and industry gallery, we have a an exhibit on the Plattsburgh Traction Company. I actually have the payroll book in there from the people from 1928, so you recognize a lot of local names, and it has their salary they made. The superintendent made seventy-seven dollars a week. Uh, so you'll see that, and I have a small exhibit on Lozier that will be changing. So I, I have a lot of stuff to show, and over the years we're going to be changing that particular uh, gallery. Yes? Days and hours? I'm sorry? Days and hours? Okay, the days are Wednesday through Saturday, 10 to 3. Sorry, I'm, I'm relatively new there. I do, I've been working on some of the exhibits. But. And I thank you for coming. I appreciate it. I'd like to, talk, huh? to, to thank uh, the Is there any questions the anybody has? Association. I've got one. Okay, you. sure. But before that, I do want to thank them. They always come in and provide this type of presentation for us and all over Plattsburgh, actually. Um, I've heard my dad, who's long since gone, talk about Lozier cars, and I thought, eh, just another car. This kind of puts things into perspective about yep. that building. And I remember him talking about the foundry mm -hmm. um, and that type of thing. So um, if you can support them by going to the museum, 
Um, and all of you coming out here tonight, it's wonderful to see all of you. Uh, next time you come in August, we're having another presentation. Hopefully we're gonna have a whole different setup here that will be beneficial to everybody. But I do, I, again, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank all I could think of, A, was the price of gas today, which I know it wasn't then, but how many gallons of gas did, yeah. could they go? The Lozier's got between 5 and 10 miles per gallon. Wow. When I talk about these big engines that were powerful, well, it takes something they make that way back yeah. in the old days. So where did they fill up on the race? <laughs> Where, how they, they won almost every race. They, they, I have a chart that some, some I'm going to be doing eventually in the future. I have a chart of all the races where they came in. And these were stock automobiles. They did not, Henry Lozier would not allow these to be modified. They had to be absolutely stock. The other cars could do what they wanted to do, but the Lozier's won anyway. So they won on their own uh, merit as opposed to... Uh, any other questions about the factory? Yes. Yeah. The boat house has got the fence around it, right? Like yes, it does. Yeah. yeah. And it looks like there's concrete down there. I walk by it every day, but it looks like bags of concrete that have been there for a couple of years by the fence. Well, what they're doing, the problem they ran into is the windows on the south side, on Cumberland Avenue side, okay. uh, window blew out and landed in the middle of Cumberland Avenue one night, in the middle of the night, I think it was 2 o'clock in the morning, and somebody almost ran over it. They saw it and stopped ahead, and they called the police, and they came down, and they had to drag it out of the way, and they did a... An evaluation, Georgia Pacific had their engineers come and look at it, and the building is just in terrible condition. It's, it's 122 years old, it just can't be saved. It would cost almost a million dollars, and they don't use it at all. The office part, you see the brick part in the front of it, uh, that hasn't been used in many years. That used to be their engineering group. One interesting parallel is uh, Georgia Pacific at its uh, top had 500 employees there, so did Lozier in 1905. Mm -hmm. They had 500 employees. Uh, yeah. GP is down to 90 people now. So you can see things, uh, you don't need all this stuff. What you don't need, a big company can't afford to keep an old building. And especially if it started to fall or catch on fire, uh, there's, it's an amazing building. And I take, we've taken a lot of photos of the inside. So you will still be able to see it, even though you won't be able to be inside. Uh, I sat there for quite a while while they, they were flying the door, drone around, and I happened to think of all the people that worked in that plant, uh, and here I am, one of the last people to sit inside the plane on the chair and look at it, kind of absorb the whole thing. Yes, sir? What happened to the crane? The crane is still in there. Uh, it weighs apparently 40 tons, and it's going to come down when the building comes down. I asked them, there's a plaque on the front of it. It was put in there in 1901, so I asked if there were any possibility, there's four bolts, it's a big heavy plaque. I asked if we could have it for the museum, for Clinton County Historical. At least there'll be a memory of that, we'll have photographs of it. Believe me, you don't want it. The thing is, it was 50 <laughs> feet long, and it 40 tons. I don't know where you'd ever do it. Huh? Seems to be the nanker. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Well, thank you folks very much. We appreciate thank it. Thank you. Thank you. Do that you will not be seeing in 2023 and beyond, been here for 120 years. And I went across the street and uh, try to get a view from the other side. Sure, this portion be, or just that back portion.
Historical the 